Hello, thank you for joining us today as we explore post-colonial literature. Post-colonial literature varies from region to region, and it continues to expand in its variety as we look at different authors and different regions. Here on our journey, we'll be going over four different authors from four different regions, and how their writings affected the cultural and social norms of each of their regions. Our first author comes from Nigeria. Chinua Achebe was born on November 16, 1930, in British-occupied Nigeria. He grew up in two worlds, one being his traditional Igbo roots, and the other being post-colonial British Christianity. He studied at the University College, a British-style university, majoring in English, theology, and history. The university is now known as the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. After college was when he decided to start writing, a decision that would make his name go down in history. The 1950s saw a new generation of black writers talking about the conditions of their lives in their own voices. Voices with a distinctive stamp and style, with Chinua Achebe leading the way of this poetic revolution. He helped to found a new Nigerian literary movement that drew on the oral traditions of Nigeria's indigenous tribes like the Yoruba, Hasu, and Igbo. The Igbo tribe originates from the Nuri Kingdom, dating back to 900 AD. The tribe has thousands of years of rich African culture instilled in their traditions. Igbo people have their own ritualistic dances, religion, holidays, and even soups. However, soup was not Chinua's main concern. His goals focused more on preserving the spoken Igbo heritage, giving a voice to an underrepresented and exploited colonial subject. The major literary movement was inspired by the way Africans were being painted in foreign literature. Achebe became passionate about the way his African culture was depicted in American and European published works as it was being represented in a degrading and, for lack of a better word, racist manner. He came to discover that Igbo values and culture were seen as inferior to those of Europeans. Additionally, Western literature merely cherry-picked what it wanted to write about, only portraying the normalized stereotypes of Africans. Chinua then set out to construct a piece of African literature that would present African characters and society in their beautiful richness and complexity. His writing style leans heavily on the Igbo oral tradition and combines straightforward narration with representations of folk stories and proverbs. He has published a number of short stories, children's books, and essay collections. Many of his pieces dealt with the social and political problems facing his nation, including the difficulties of its post-colonial legacy. In this revolutionary literary movement, Achebe wrote his most famous novel in English, a decision that was controversial to the people of the movement. Though the Defiance campaign was an affront on white supremacy, Achebe wanted to achieve cultural revitalization within and through English. Despite this decision, he still manages to capture the charm of the Igbo language and Things Fall Apart. Things Fall Apart takes place in the 1890s and follows our protagonist, Okonkwo, who is the leader of an Igbo community. It tells the events of his exile and banishment for the accidental murdering of a member of the community to his redemption and return from home. All the while, white men and missionaries are pouring into the village. It portrays the conflict between the country's white colonial government and the traditional culture of the Igbo people. Achebe's novel shatters the stereotypical European portraits of native Africans. All the while, he makes sure to write about what life was like before the European interactions. Achebe's novel focuses on three main themes. First, the traditions of Igbo society. Second, the effect of Christian influences on the Igbo people. Finally, the clash of Western and traditional Nigerian values during and after the colonial era. Bessie Amelia Head was born at Fort Napier Hospital in Pieter Maritzburg, Natal, South Africa. Head described her childhood as a haphazard and self-reliant one, juggled between various child welfare organizations. The extreme prejudice she experienced was excessive, even by South African standards at the time, and continued to afflict her throughout her life. The issue of mixed race prejudice became a prominent theme in her writings, markedly in her second novel, Maru. 
had completed her junior certificate at the end of 1953 and decided to continue her studies with a two-year teacher training certificate. She then moved to Johannesburg, where she was employed at Home Post. Her assigned tasks included editing the girly romances published each issue and writing two popular weekly columns, one for children and the other for teenagers. Her portrayal of masculine and feminine forms in this early work have been viewed as going against the dominant portrayal of the genders and as possibly the earliest gender perspectives and critique within 1950s black journalism. Around this time, she began to present signs of mania and depression, a particular period of despair leading to an attempted suicide. In late 1965, Head started writing seriously, often by candlelight. She was desperately poor and relied on the moral support and money posted by Patrick Cullinan. In 1966, she left for Redsdale, a small village south of Palape. There she met Vernon Gibbert, an agriculturalist running a government-owned experimental farm, and was permitted to live and work there. Her stay lasted only a few months, but the skills learned aided her greatly, both practically in knowing how to farm, drop prone land, and in providing material for her first novel, When Rain Clouds Gather. Critics have described her writing on gardening as evocative of her mental health. But she experienced both the land and her mental state shifting between vitality and abundance to desolation. Like the cycle of the seasons, however, each decline with head foreshadowed a spectacular creative resurgence, both in her work and in her fierce self determinacy as a mixed race woman, largely unaccepted within her own community. She also discussed the topics of solitude, alienation, women, and sexuality, the polarities of beauty versus evil, pleasure versus earnestness, and her immense admiration for D.H. Lawrence, among other influences such as Mahatma Gandhi's political statements and children's stories like Alice in Wonderland and Winnie the Pooh. In 1971, Maru was published, looking at the abuse of tribal power in the Soroya community. This was followed by A Question of Power, often viewed as her most ambitious novel, and addressed issues of racial and tribal prejudice. In their tribute to Bessie Head, progressive literary magazine Stuff Writer wrote, She was a vigorous storyteller, a novelist who swerved her commentary to mirror the dehumanization of South African black people in new ways, an exile who rebuilt her personal identity amidst multiracial benevolence, and cooperative effort of Botswana society, and a writer who married the tradition of the novel of literacy itself with an older African oral tradition. In 2003, she was awarded the South African Order of Ikamanga in gold for her exceptional contribution to li literature and the struggle for social change, freedom, and peace. In 2007, the Bessie Head Heritage Trust and Bessie Head Literature Awards were established. Born on June 19, 1947, in Mumbai, India, Salman Rushdie came into a world that was experiencing the effects of decolonization. Growing up in a household of seven people, Rushdie's father was a prosperous Muslim businessman and his mother was a teacher. Despite having a religious background, he would ultimately declare himself to be an atheist later in life. Sometime during his teen years, Rushdie and his family would move to Pakistan. Rushdie's educational journey began at the Cathedral and John Connon School in Mumbai, India. Starting at 13 years old, Rushdie attended Rugby School, which is a grammar school located in the United Kingdom. He would then go on to attain a master's degree in history from the University of Cambridge in 1968. While working as an advertising copywriter during the 1970s, Rushdie published his first book, Grimace, in 1975. This novel wasn't a success. It wouldn't be until 1981 when Rushdie published his second novel, Midnight's Children. Okay. He would gain international recognition for his work as a writer. A couple of Rushdie's other books include Shane, published in 1983, and The Titanic Verses, published in 1988. 
The latter book earned Rushdie severe criticism from the Muslim community in Britain, who claimed that the book was a blasphemous. This criticism went so far that in 1989, the revolutionary leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, called for a fatwa against Rushdie, which called for Muslims around the world to execute Rushdie. The fatwa against him would cause Rushdie to go into hiding for the next 10 years. Salman Rushdie is still alive today, and he is currently 74 years old. As we step away from looking at Rushdie's life, we will take a look at one of Rushdie's most popular novels, Shame. Published in 1983, Shame starts off in the fictional town of Kew, also called Nishapur, which is based on the real-life town of Quetta, Pakistan. The main character, Omar Khayyam Shakil, is raised by three sisters who act as his mothers. Some years later on his birthday, Omar's moms allow him to leave Kew as a birthday present. Whereupon, Omar enrolls in school and becomes a doctor. Somewhere along the line, Omar and a man named Iskander Harafa become friends. Iskander goes on to marry a woman named Rani Humayun and enters into politics when he turns 40. Iskander's political rival, Raza Haider, has two daughters named Sophia and Naveed, with the nicknames Shame and Good News, respectively. Having only reached the mental age of nine, Sophia has an unusual trait. She carries all of the unfelt shame in the world, and at times, this shame can physically manifest itself into the form of a dangerous beast and cause Sophia to wreak havoc wherever she may be. All this is important because Omar eventually meets, falls in love with, and marries Sophia. For some reason, Omar can't have sex with Sophia, so he gets with her nursemaid, Shabanu. When Sophia realizes this, her beast starts to come out in more violent ways and cause even more destruction. Omar and Raza then drug Sophia and lock her in the attic in order to prevent her from hurting anyone. It isn't long before Sophia escapes her prison by turning into a mythical creature called the White Panther and terrorizes the country. Having tracked Omar back to his childhood home, Sophia beheads Omar not long before exploding through a ball of fire and burning the whole place down. Sadly, this book does not have a happy ending and instead ends in tragedy. Now we shall turn our attention towards the theme of our novel. The main theme within Rushdie's novel is, as the name suggests, shame. Through the character of Sophia, this novel shows us what kind of effect shame can have on us. Due to her mental disability and violent episodes, Sophia's parents hide her away from the rest of the world. We also don't try to get Sophia married until she meets Omar. Her father also despises the fact that his firstborn child was a girl. Sophia quickly learns to hate and despise herself for the way that she is. Over time, this self-hatred builds and builds until it bursts out in the form of Sophia's beast. These rampages are responsible for the deaths of many Pakistani people, including her own husband, Omar. Sophia's journey represents how unfortunate circumstances, your environment, and your upbringing can lead to acts of evil. In this novel, shame acts as an open door through which violence openly flows. Both consciously and subconsciously, our respective cultures can influence how we do anything. In Rusty's case, this would be his writing. Maurice Conde is a timeless author within her region and during her time. Westerners and certain groups during the post-colonial era have begun to grow attached to the idea of cultural supremacy and racial superiority over other races. Social standings were solidified based on race or belief, and before long, colonizers had developed a subservient relationship to the colonized. Before long, many acts of terror and subservience had occurred, and outrage began to spread throughout the Caribbeans. Many of the colonized fought in their own ways to combat the mistreatment of the minority. However, Maurice Conde had taken to writing to fight against the growing conflict between the colonized and the colonizers. Maurice Conde's early life had consisted of an average living with her parents, who were educators. Given this, Conde became educated at an early age. She was talented in her literary devices, creating a one-man play to present to her mother on her birthday at the age of 12. Between this time period, not much was known until she had attended a rehearsal, where she had become acquainted with Mamadou Conde, and eventually married and had four children with him before moving to the Ivory Coast. Her first book would not be published until she was 40 years old because she had believed it was not up to publishing standards and that it would be immediately taken off of shelves for being too controversial. 
Her books had explored many racial, cultural, and gender issues that had occurred historically with topics that she weaves into the story. Her historical fictions have always favored a more direct approach to many feminist ideas and political concerns, and had always been written to speak out about the minority. Though she had kept away from certain Caribbean movements, she had fought against the belief of racial and cultural supremacy in the past and brought people together through her political beliefs, which were portrayed in most of her texts. I, Tituba, Black Witch of Salem, is among the few most popular in her bibliography, going through the 1600s infamous witch trials. In this period of time, Puritan Christian teachings were infamously strict and harsh. Maurice mirrors her life through Tituba, a mixed African woman who is subjected to mental trauma at an early age and sent out into the world without a family figure. Being a slave and the first convicted of witchcraft, Tituba quickly became a historical figure. Tituba's character draws a lot on Mama Yaya, an elderly healer that took care of Tituba through her early life. Many of the scenes that take place within Tituba, Black Witch of Salem, are based on Conde's own political beliefs which are revealed through what the characters say. For instance, during Tituba's imprisonment, she met with Hester Prynne, the iconic woman from the famous novel, The Scarlet Letter. Both women conversed about feminist topics within the cell they were both held in. Small scenes discussing political topics was her main way of showing the reader her thoughts on such topics. Such were so controversial that her first book, Hera McConan, was taken off the shelves only six months after she criticized the upcoming success of African socialism, a belief in sharing economic resources in a traditional African way. Conde's exploration and interpretations of the many cultures that she had studied upon had given not only a new insight on the past from the reader's perspective, but also shone light on the mistreatment of the minority during those eras. Her work is a classic example of learning from the past.